Psalm chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the injured. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord. 
in the original Hebrew, this would have sounded very, very different. If you have your Bible open, if you look closely, you will notice that the first instance of the word Lord is written in all capital letters. The letters are in small text, but they're all capitalized. While the second occurrence of the word Lord, the L is capitalized, but then it's written in lowercase. This is not by accident. In our English translations of the Bible, when you see the word Lord written in all capital letters, the translators are letting you know that this is an instance where the covenantal name of God is used. This is the name that God gave Himself when He revealed Himself to Moses at the burning bush, where God referred to Himself simply as, I am who I am. And we know this to be the name Yahweh. It reflects God as the faithful and the self-existent one, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who exists will always exist and will never change. The one who depends on no one, yet everyone and everything depends on Him. Lord, in all capital letters, refers to this name of God. But when we see the word Lord written with a capital L and the rest of the letters written in lowercase, the translators are cluing us in on the fact that this is an instance where the word Adonai is used. Adonai means master or ruler. Adonai means Lord in the sense of a sovereign king. So we ask the question, what does it mean uh, for God to be sovereign? When we speak of God's sovereignty, biblically, we're speaking of His power and His authority. God has absolute authority and power to ordain whatever He wills to come to pass. Meaning there is not one thing or one person in creation outside of His control. There isn't any series of events that takes place in this creation outside of Him allowing it to come to pass. You have to understand that He created the universe and everything that dwells in it. That, it, that for, therefore, He owns the universe and everything that dwells in it. And that ownership gives Him certain rights. And those rights are He may do with this universe and its inhabitants whatever His holy will pleases to do. That's what it means to be Adonai. That's what it means to be a sovereign master. So when you take these two names of God and you put them back into Psalm 8, O Lord, our little Lord, in the Hebrew is O Yahweh, our Adonai. And by doing this, you can see why David would proclaim God's name as majestic. A self-existent being who rules the creation with absolute sovereignty. David's God is a big God. Let's finish reading verse 1. It says, You have set your glory above the heavens. Lord speaks of fame, prestige, and honor. Again, David, David here is magnifying the majesty of God. Now this isn't in the text, but I would like to just talk theology for just a second on this theme of God's glory. One of the chief ways that I think God glorifies Himself is when He reveals Himself to us in the Scriptures. Now, I'm speaking now of God's attributes. These are qualities that Scripture tells us that God has. This is how God has revealed Himself to be. Just a few, just a few examples. First and foremost, God is holy. Meaning He is set apart. He is weighty in His perfection. In Isaiah 6, the seraphim that fly around the throne cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. God is omniscient, meaning that He knows everything. Romans 11, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor? God is omnipresent, meaning that He sees everything. Jeremiah 23, can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. God is omnipotent, meaning that He is all-powerful. Daniel 4, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and He does according to His will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And none can stay His hand or say to Him, What have you done? God possesses a saying. He is self-existent. He, 
He does not depend on anyone or anything. Psalm 50. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your fold. For every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. God is just. Meaning that He always, in every situation, does what is right. Deuteronomy 32. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is He. God is immutable. Meaning that God does not change. Everything that God is, He has always been. He will always be that way. Malachi 3. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. And there are many, many more attributes of God. And there are some good books out there to walk you through these. And I highly recommend picking one up. Read it along with your Bible. And look at the Scripture references as you go. And this is why I recommend doing this. Jeremiah 9, 23-24 says... Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love and justice and righteousness in all the earth. For in these things I delight, the presence of the Lord. Now, I hope you're getting the picture that I'm trying to paint with all of this in verse 1. This being that David was praising in Psalm 8 is truly magnificent. My prayer of each grove is that we will grow in our view of God. So often, and I don't think we do it intentionally, but we confuse morality with Christianity. Christianity is not a morality program. Being a Christian is about you, isn't about you trying to stop doing all the bad things that you do and trying to be good so that you can go to heaven someday. Christianity is about understanding who God is. Understanding how He has revealed Himself to us and what He has done for us in Jesus Christ. Christianity is finding Jesus to be the most important thing in your life. And when He becomes that, when your life is consumed with Christ, the morality and the other stuff will flow out of that. So again, be strong. From young believers to old saints and everyone in the middle, Let's always strive to grow in our knowledge of God as He has revealed Himself in the Scriptures because it glorifies Him. So, why paint this picture? Why, why spend so much time just showing you a glimpse of God's majesty? I'm doing this so that you will see what, what, what's happening in the rest of the psalm. We've just described a small fraction of what God tells us He's like. Now, let's just assume for a second that God has some enemies. How could God defeat His enemies and put on display His majesty in such a way that His name will get the most glory? Verse 2 tells us how God does it. Let's look at it. Verse 2. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. God establishes His strength and defeats His enemy by using the most weak and helpless of all people. God defeats His enemies through the mouths of children. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, and as a result, He gets the glory. Because when God uses the weak and the most unqualified people possible to fight His fight, it becomes very obvious that these people didn't do it on their own. They obviously had help. And then because of all that, the glory goes to God. And this concept is all over our Bibles. Uh, it should be on the screen, but look at 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. 
And why, why does he do things this way? Verse 29. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God gets all the glory. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9. You guys should remember this story too. Paul has his thorn in the flesh. Verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is just the way God has chosen to operate. He glorifies His name in the weak and the helpless. Now, I want to show you in Psalm 8 how this concept of God defeating His enemies through the mouths of children works itself out. First thing we ask is, what did David have in mind when he wrote these words in verse 2? What's the context around verse 2? And the truth is, we don't really know. There is no context around those words. David could possibly be talking about himself. It is believed that he was an adolescent when he defeated Goliath. If you want to look at it allegorically, he could be referring to the nation of Israel, who was like a weak child when compared to the Gentile nations that surrounded her. But honestly, these are all guesses. We don't, we don't exactly know what David had in mind when he penned verse 2. So does that mean we can't understand it? Does that mean we can't understand what's written in this verse? Absolutely not. Far better than David's purpose behind verse 2. I want to show you what Jesus had in mind behind verse 2. Look with me to Matthew 21. This would have been the last, this would have been the last week of Jesus' life. Okay, he's, he's in entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Okay, we, we all know this story. As they get close to Jerusalem, Jesus sends two of his disciples ahead to bring him back a donkey. He's going to ride into town on a donkey, and they're going to wave the palm branches before him and cry Hosanna's before him. So let's stop and ask, why? Why take this time to stop and get a donkey? Jesus walked all over the place. Right? He, didn't, he didn't need the donkey to carry him. So why does he do this? Well, Matthew tells us why Jesus stops and gets the donkey in verses 4 and 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of food. Jesus took the time to stop and get the donkey and ride the donkey into town because the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9, verse 9 of his book had prophesied about it. And so when these people saw Jesus on the donkey coming into town on Palm Sunday, their minds should have immediately went to the book of Zechariah. By doing this, Jesus is communicating to the people that He is their King. And He is coming just like the prophets of old said He would. He is fulfilling what was written about Him in their Scriptures. That He is truly their Messiah. That's what's being communicated by this act of riding into town on a donkey. That's an easy one, right? So, what's this got to do with Psalm 8? We're still in Matthew 21. If you look down to the next section where Jesus goes in and cleanses the temple. You guys remember this story too, right? Jesus goes into the temple. He sees what's taking place. And He is angered. And he starts turning over the tables of the money chambers. And when the people in the temple saw Him do this, they came up to Him. And let's look at what they did. Let's pick it up in verse 14. It says, And the blind and the lame came to Him in the temple, and He healed them. But when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things that He did, and look at this, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David. Don't, don't miss this. The children, the weak, helpless children, are singing the praises of Jesus in the temple. They were saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. They saw what Christ was doing, and they got it. They knew who Jesus was, and they are praising Him. Well, how did the chief priests and the scribes react to this? Verse 15 tells us. They were indignant. They were angered by this. They saw these children crying out to Jesus, and it infuriated them. Verse 16. And they said to Him, right? this chief priest said to Jesus, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, very simply, Yes, yes I have. And then he says, have you never read? 
Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And leaving him, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Jesus looks at these chief priests. He looks at these scribes. And he says, yeah, I hear them. And then he says, have you never read Psalm 8? And then he quotes it for them. Now Jesus quotes Psalm 8 here from the Septuagint. It's an early Greek translation of the Old Testament. That's why the wording is just a little different. But the chief priest and the scribes knew exactly where Jesus was quoting from. Dr. James Boyce had this to say about this exchange. If these leaders of the people had been indignant before, they must have been, become nearly catatonic now. For by identifying the praise of the children of Jerusalem with Psalm 80, Jesus not only validated their words, showing them to be proper, that He was indeed the Son of David, the Messiah, He also interpreted their praise as praise not of mere man, which a mere son of David would be, but of God. Since the psalm says that God has ordained praise for Himself from the lips of children. Dr. Boyce is saying that by Jesus pointing to Psalm 8 the way He did here, He's making Himself equal with God. So that the chief priests were mad at the children for saying what they did, when Christ confirmed what they said, it would have threw these priests into a rage. It made them so mad that they killed Him. Okay? Christ was crucified on the charge of blasphemy. He kept saying He was God. You have to understand, Christ never made an unintentional statement or an inadvertent move. Jesus required that donkey to be brought to Him so that He might ride it into town. He was fulfilling prophecy in Zechariah 9.9 that presented Him as the Jewish Messiah. When Jesus refuses to silence the children in the temple who are singing His praises, even though the chief priests and the scribes are indignant about it, Jesus is fulfilling Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, where again He declares Himself to be God, and God's strength is established out of the mouth of babies and infants. God chose what is weak in the world to shame what is strong. I said earlier that we don't know exactly what David meant or the context around verse 2 when he wrote it. But Jesus in Matthew 21 makes it very clear. When David wrote Psalm 8, he was talking about me. Again, Psalm 8 is about the majesty of God's name throughout all the earth. And we have saw the first way that God's name is made great. He defeats his enemies through the weak things of the world. In this instance, the weakness of children. Now let's move on to the second part of the psalm, verses 3 through 8, where we will see the second way that God's name is made majestic. And that is by ruling the world through the weakness of man. So let's look at how David sets this up. Verse 3 of Psalm 8. David starts a comparison. He says on one hand, verse 3, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars, which you have set in place. Let's stop there. David says, when I look at your heavens, okay, and in this instance, he's talking about the nighttime sky because he mentions the moon and the stars. David looks up, he's taking in all the beauty of the nighttime sky, and he's lost in wonder. How small and insignificant are we when compared to the one who created it all? Think about this. David didn't have the technology that we have today. David was probably laying on his back in a field somewhere looking up. But not us. We have massive telescopes. We have satellites. We have the ability to see things that David never even dreamed of. We now know that God, that this God that made the moon and the stars made a whole lot of stars. He's put, he has put into place billions of stars. We don't even know how many different planets and galaxies there are out in the vastness of space. And David calls it the work of his fingers. Right? Not by the sweat of his brow. Not that it took God thousands of years to accomplish this. God did it with His fingers. This was just like work for David's God. Very much like the understatement of Moses in the creation account uh, in Genesis 1.16. Moses said, And God made the two lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And the stars. It's like Moses almost forgot to mention the stars. Now just for, just for fun, I pulled up Google on the computer and just type in, how, how many stars are in the sky? 
The first thing that popped up on the screen said there was a hundred billion stars just in our galaxy. And we're not talking about all the other galaxies in the universe. Now, I don't know if that's right or not, obviously. But I know this. Whatever number it is, it's big. If you're guessing a hundred billion, there's a lot of them. And Moses, and Moses says, and the stars. And the stars. Is our view of God that big? David's was. He looked at the nighttime sky and was in awe of the word of God's fingers. And then comes the contrast, the comparison. Verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly being and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. While David considered the greatness of the heavens, it also made David consider the relative smallness and insignificance of man. David wondered why a big, great God would be mindful of such small human beings. What is man that you are mindful of? I spent a lot of my time this morning trying to make every effort to point out all the details of the majesty of God in the Scripture. My, my hope is that our view of God might grow. That we would view God the way David did. That we would reverence God the way David did. But now I want to paint another picture. David here in these verses is very clearly recalling their creation account in Genesis. Where God created the first man, Adam. And he placed him in a garden. And in Genesis 1, 26-31, he gave him dominion over the creation. Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That word dominion means that God made Adam a king. King of the garden, king of creation. It's very clear here, Adam was given authority from God to rule over whatever God had made. God gave Adam some amount of sovereignty in this. Gave it to him, told him to rule it. And you all know what Adam did next. Just two chapters later in Genesis 3. Adam, this creature from the dirt, disobeyed the Almighty God. Adam, the one who was crowned with glory and honor, committed treason against the Holy One. He fathomed that. Because he ate of the fruit which God forbade, Adam not only lost his dominion that day, he also introduced sin into creation. From that day forward, creation, which we were supposed to rule, has worked against us. From that day forward, the ground has produced thorns and thistles. And by the sweat of his brow, man has to work hard for his food. From that day forward, we, as humans, have come out of the womb as criminals. We are born into this world in Adam. Meaning Adam is our representative head. We have a nature in us that is in rebellion against God. And because of this, we desire to possess the dominion that God gave mankind. But in reality, we only try in vain to rule over His creation. We don't have dominion over it. We don't possess sovereignty over it. Do you know that over one million people die each year from mosquito bites? One little tiny bug. We don't have dominion over mosquitoes. We battle against them. In preparing this, I read story after story of people being killed by wild and tamed animals. I read story after story of natural disasters, hurricanes, tsunamis, tornadoes, where there were large number of casualties. It's not hard to look around and see that this creation is broken. That man does not have dominion. That raises a problem. 
What is David talking about here in the psalm? David writes as if all of these things that God gave Adam in the creation account are still true. So if you're like me, you read this and you wind up with your head in your hands, because it doesn't make any sense. So again, much like verse 2, what do we do with this? How and when does this come true? When does man regain dominion over creation? And once again, like verse 2, we turn to the pages of the New Testament to find our answer. We let the Bible interpret the Bible. Let me show you something that's just incredible. If we look together to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. In Hebrews chapter 2, the author's goal is to explain to the people how Christ is superior to the angels. Okay? In verse 5 it says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. That somewhere is Psalm 8, because he quotes it. What is man that you are mindful of? Or the son of man that you care for him? You, have, you made Him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned Him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under His feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to Him, He left nothing outside His control. But, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to Him. We're still battling mosquitoes, right? But, we see Him for a little while who was made lower than the angels. Namely, who? Jesus. Crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might face death for everyone. Do you see what just happened here? The writer of Hebrews took Psalm chapter 8, all those glorious things that David recalled about the creation account, about the glory and the honor that was given to man, about him being a little lower than the angels, about all things being subjected to him, being dominion. Sovereignty, which was all true in the creation account before the fall. The writer of Hebrews says all those verses that David wrote in Psalm 8 find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ, the God man. What the first Adam forfeited that day in the Garden of Eden, the second Adam regained on the cross of Calvary. In Scripture, it will sometimes refer to humankind as having one of two representative heads. All people fall into one of these two categories. You are either in the first Adam, meaning you are still in your sin, or you are in the second Adam, which refers to Christ, and your sin has been paid for. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 45, it says, Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural. And then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. That second Adam, that man of heaven referred to here is Jesus Christ. And He is the man that fulfills what David wrote in Psalm 8. He is the picture of what perfect humanity was intended to be. Jesus is why David could write as if all those things were still true. Jesus became representative of mankind. And it is to Christ that God places all things under His feet. It is to Christ who has been crowned with honor and glory. So that one thing, though. If you remember, when I started this second part of Psalm 8, I said the second way God's name is made majestic is by ruling the world through the weakness of man. How is that true? What I've explained to you so far, we have seen the God-man do some incredible things. But mankind has proved itself to be an utter failure. In the first Adam, we are weak. In 
and we are wretched. But everything changes when we become believers. When God cries open our wretched hearts, and He places within us a soft heart, when He gives us eyes to see the truth of Jesus Christ crucified for the sins of man, when He gives us ears to hear the gospel of God's amazing grace, when He gives us a gift of repentance, and we fall on our face, and we give our lives over to His kingship, brothers and sisters, we are no longer weak and wretched. At salvation, we become the weak and the righteous. We become conquerors. And I want to show you two passages that explain what I mean. The first one is Revelation 2, 26-27. Jesus says to the church at Thyatira, Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Did you catch that? To him I will give authority over the nations, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. One more. I think it should be on the screen. Revelation 3, 20 and 21 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. You know who sits on thrones? Rulers do. Kings do. Now don't misunderstand me. We are not equal with God. He will always be the ultimate sovereign. But these two passages in Revelation tell us that in somehow and in some way, believers who pers persevere to the end will sit with Christ on His throne and rule the nations. I have trouble even fathoming that. Right now in this world, Christians are mocked. They're looked down upon as ignorant. And in some places, they're even physically persecuted. We are weak. But at His coming, Jesus will rule the world by means of these weak believers. The, the fact that He would allow us to be in this honorable position, to hold some position of authority, whatever that looks like, when He comes again, is simply amazing. And again, What's the whole point behind doing it this way? That God's name might be made majestic. That God will get the glory. In the same way that Christ conquered and was allowed to sit on the throne of the Father, we will sit on the throne of Christ. I think there's only one fitting way to close this message. And that is to say with David, in verse 9. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Uh, Jimmy, you guys can come on up to the floor, uh, We're going to have a, a time of commitment now before we're dismissed. Um, Chad, our associate pastor, is going to go in the back, and uh, I'll be here at the front. If, you, if we can pray with you, or if you just need to come and pray with you this morning, uh, feel free to come and do that. But just before just before Jimmy starts, I want to say this. God gave Adam a command in the garden. Don't eat from the tree, fruit, fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and Adam disobeyed that command, and we see where that went. Jesus, in Acts 17.30, says through Paul, that the time of ignorance God has overlooked. But now, God commands all men everywhere to repent. And I say this from the bottom of my heart. This is one command we do not want to disobey. So as we have this time, I just pray that you would consider your position before God this morning.
Jesus name. I'm dismissed.